Welcome to the ministry of Barefoot Church. I'm Clay Neesmith, the pastor here at Barefoot Church. And man, we hope what you experience here today uh, will encourage you, motivate you, and inspire you in a great, great way. It is great to see you on this 4th of July weekend. We so happen to have the 4th of July fall on a Sunday, a worship day. Uh, And so it's great to see you in the house of the Lord celebrating our freedom today. Aren't you glad that God has given us a great country to live in that offers us the freedom to worship him? Come on. And uh, everybody don't have this privilege. They don't have this opportunity. And we are grateful to God uh, for it and uh, thankful for the great country that we live in. You know, if you have your Bibles with you today, I want to talk a little bit about freedom. I want to talk about the freedom that is found in Christ Jesus. Because oftentimes, freedom can be misunderstood, can it? I mean, if you really think about it, whenever we say freedom, we have freedom, what does that mean to you? Does that really mean that you're just kind of free uh, to do whatever you want to do with your life and uh, kind of run at life in whatever comes into your mind. And honestly, that is not always a true freedom. And true freedom is really understanding who I am and what, I've cre- what I'm created to be and walk in the fullness of it without, without having bondage or without having anything holding me back. And so we want to talk about what it means to be free in a Christ uh, today. If you have your Bibles, open it up to Galatians chapter 5. That's where we'll start today. And then we're going to move to an encounter that Jesus has with a very sick man to offer him freedom. And then we're going to go to a story that Jesus told to kind of sum it all up in Matthew chapter 5. And so, again, we'll start off with what the writer wrote to the church at Galatia about being free in Christ. This is what he says. He says, So Christ has truly set us free. And he says something interesting. He says, now make sure that you stay free. In other words, don't don't go back into bondage. Don't go back into slavery. He says, make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up in slavery again. How? To the law. Now that's a fascinating passage of scripture because Basically, the writer here is talking to a group of people who have put their faith, their trust, their belief in who Jesus is, the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. This is after the ascension of Jesus. The writer says, look, Christ came to offer you freedom. He came to offer you a connection to your creator so you could walk in the fullness of the freedom that you have been created for. He says, but don't get yourself tied back up into bondage or in slavery. How? He says, to the law. And the reason that's interesting is because what that tells me is that we can be in bondage one way and then, then basically be set free and allow ourselves to be put in bondage another way. Jesus told a story that helps us understand this. And that story is found in Matthew chapter seven. It's against the backdrop of him talking to to people, explaining who he was, explaining how to live life free. And then what he does is he finishes off that story uh, in Matthew chapter seven. And we're gonna take a look at that in a moment. But to illustrate how people can move from what I refer to as one side of a wide road to another side of a wide road. In other words, if you run in the ditch on one side of the road, that's one thing. But if you just kind of get back in the middle of the road and you run in the ditch on the other side of the road, that's another thing, right? But what I'm referring to here is oftentimes people get their life off track and don't live out who God has created them to be. And whenever they recognize a freedom they oftentimes move to the other side of a wide road that Jesus talks about in Matthew 7, um, and, and, and they miss the very freedom that Jesus came to offer them. So let's look at this passage of Scripture where it illustrates this in John, John chapter 5. Now, this is a story here where Jesus had an encounter with a man 
beside a pool. And that man had been sick for 38 years. He was laying beside the pool. And Jesus came up to him and asked him a remarkable question. He said, hey, you've been laying here by this pool of water where people come to get healed often. You've been laying here for 38 years. He says, do you want to get well? And so the man says, yes, I want to get well, but there's a problem. I don't have anybody to help me get in the pool. And someone always breaks in line in front of me and gets in the pool before me. Because the story tells us that the first person in the pool normally got, got healed in the water. And he says, everybody's always breaking line and there's nobody here to help me. Well, Jesus is like, well, I've come to help you. But what's interesting is Jesus doesn't basically put him in the pool. Jesus says, you can be healed today if you trust that I've come to you, that I've walked here among you today. He says, you can be healed. And then the man's healed. But what happens is Jesus heals the man on a religious law holiday. And it was the Sabbath. It was on the Sabbath day. He heals the man. And there were some people that got upset about the man's healing. And this was the religious law keepers. And they basically told the man, even though you've been laying there for 38 years, he gets up and takes his mat. They say, you're working, you're toting your mat. On a, on, a, on a holiday, and you need to know that that's no way to, to basically get to God. You, you're breaking one of God's laws. And so, though Jesus had healed him, these people were upset with him. Well, Jesus comes to the man, and he says something remarkable, and this is what I want to show you. It's found in John chapter 5, verse, verse 14. The Bible says after all this encounter that this man has with Jesus and has with the religious people and they're very disappointed, Jesus comes to him afterwards. He found him in the temple and he told him, now you are well, so stop sinning. Now that's an interesting comment, isn't it? I, I made you well, I, I healed you. You were laying by a pool, you know, at sick for 38 years. Nobody helped you get in the pool. You could never be the first one in the pool. I didn't even have to put you in the pool. I just came to you. I healed you. And he tells the man, he says, now that you've been made well, what I need you to do is I need you to stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. The reason I find that fascinating is simply Jesus had already healed the man. And so how was the man sinning. How was the man missing the mark of God's glorious standard? Was he doing something evil? What was he doing bad things? I mean, I think it's a great question to ask because Jesus literally says, you know, I've come to you. I've healed you. Now stop missing the mark of God's glorious standard or something even worse is going to happen to you. And so as I dig into this passage, something I realize is how the man's sinning is basically he moved from being paralyzed and being beside a pool and not, not having Jesus in front of him to Jesus coming to him, healing him. And now he moves back listening to the religious law leaders of that day. And they're saying, you know, you need to follow the law and it's wrong for you to be carrying your mat. Though Jesus come to you and healed you, you're still being wrong following by, by not following the law. And what Jesus is saying, you know what? You're sinning just as bad when you're listening to that's the way to connect with your creator versus laying beside a pool, you know what, on the wayward side of, of the road, now you've gone to the religious side of the road. So how was the man sinning? The man was sinning because he was paying attention to what the law keepers were saying to him versus what Jesus had already done in him. See, see what happens a lot of times in church, and let's just call it in the modern day church, is something very similar. People are on what, let's call it, the wayward side of the road. And they're, they're doing life the way they want to do it. 
In other words, they're doing things that, that make them feel good or make them numbed out. We would call it wayward things. And they finally decide, look, this is not working, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop doing what we would refer to as this bad stuff. And I'm gonna shift gears and I'm gonna start doing this good stuff. I'm gonna start going to church. I'm gonna start, you know what, doing religious stuff. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start maybe taking communion every time I come to God's house. And all of these things are gonna help me get my life in order and then it's gonna help me discover who God is and it's gonna help God know that I am serving him and I'm doing these good things. So in other words, it's gonna help me get to God. I, I'm, in other words, I'm tired of living over here in doing life my own way and running in my own direction. So what I think I'll do is I'll come over here and do life the way people say I should do life so I can get to God. And, and can I tell you something? If that is you, according to Galatians chapter five, you're tying yourself up in, in slavery again because you're tying yourself to a bunch of rules, a bunch of regulations instead of a relationship with God. And what I want us to understand today is God never created you to be outside of a relationship with him. But what happens is people try their best to get back in a right relationship with God all of their life by doing, doing all kinds of things or they feel like God don't want a relationship with them because of the things they've done. Both of those things are missing the mark of God's glorious standard. Both of those things are what we would refer to as sin because sin is literally this, missing who God has made me to be, missing God's glorious standard. And we've all missed the mark of God's glorious standard, but the question is, do we really believe that God still wants a relationship with us? Because that determines a lot about your freedom. Because if you think that God don't want a relationship with, with, with you because of who you are, what you've done, or what you are doing, then you're totally missing what church and what Christ is all about. Because Christ says that he came to give us life and to give it to us to the full. And the reason I share that story about this man who was laying beside a pool and he was lame and then he gets healed and now he goes back in listening to those religious law leaders, Jesus tells him to stop sinning. And the reason I find that fascinating is because I do believe we can move from being wayward to being, to being very religious and miss the free life that Jesus came to offer us. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 7. Let me share it with you. He says, he says in Matthew 7, beginning with verse 13, he says, you can't enter God's king, you, you can only enter God's kingdom through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide. For the many who choose, there are many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow. The gateway to freedom is very narrow and the road is difficult and only few ever find it. He says, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act, what they, what they say. He goes on to say this. He says, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. And Jesus says, not everyone who calls, calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, 
We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name and performed miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, why is that so significant? Why is that so important? Because what Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, in reality, God created you for purpose. And what God has created you to do is is be an image bearer of him here on earth. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and eventually he created human beings, both male and female in his image. And he created us both male and female in his image, basically to govern this earth. But man stepped away from that. And so our original design was to be in relationship with God trust him, depend on him for everything we need in life, let him speak into our life, and then live that out here in this earth. However, that was his will, but we stepped away from it. And so the Bible says what happens is since humanity stepped away from God, that ever since then, God has always been about coming to humanity. But what happens is many of us continually try to get back in this right relationship with God. We run our life off the rails, then we move back over here and we start trying to do all this religious stuff. I want you to know that the law of God, the law of Moses that God gave Moses was never intended to make anybody right with God. It wasn't intended to make you right with God. But what it was intended to do was to show you that you had missed the mark of God's glorious standard and that God was gonna come make things right with you. And so oftentimes people say, hey, you know what, I I have found God. No, 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 God comes and finds you. And sometimes it may be, you know what, in your waywardness at rock bottom. Other times it may be in your bondage that you have because you're just as miserable doing all of this religious stuff. And you're like, this isn't freedom. I'm, I'm not living a free life. All I'm doing is doing all of this ritualistic stuff. I'm I'm trying to get to God. I'm trying to perform for God. And I'm a miserable person. And what I want you to understand today, none of this stuff that we do in in our religious activity is to do things for us to get to God. God has already come to us. Everything we do is to remember who God is and what he did for us on a cross as he gave the life of his one and only son for us. Everything is to remember that, but it's to remember that God has already come to us when we take communion. We're not taking communion to make ourselves right with God. The Bible says when we take communion, we take the Lord's Supper, when you eat that cracker, when you drink that juice, it is simply for you to remember that God has already come to you. And so if you, or wayward and, you know, just kind of running life off the rails and you come into the church and you're like, man, I'm going to come take communion, uh, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to come take this every single week to make myself right with God. You're missing it. You're missing that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. In other words, God don't expect you to get to him. God always wants to come to you. And when you realize that God wants to come to you, everything changes. So what Jesus is saying in this passage is, listen, there's a broad road and it's wide. And many people, many people walk this broad road and miss the narrow road of who I am and miss the freedom that life life offers. And can I tell you something? There's a lot of people walking this broad road because they've moved from one side of the broad road to the other side of the broad road. I I like to draw a picture and I wanna show it to you today because I think it, it helps us understand what Jesus is saying in this passage. And literally, Jesus is saying in Matthew 7, there's a broad road that leads to a dead end. And what I have been sharing with you throughout this particular message is some people are on one side of that broad road and 
They are basically doing life in their own power, doing life any kind of way they want to do it, and they're not experiencing freedom. And eventually, you know what? That leads to a, to a dead-end street. Jesus says there's other people who are doing things to get to me, and that's what we're calling religious activity, and that leads to the same place. It's, it's a dead end. And why people don't have freedom to be who God has created them to be oftentimes is because they're continually trying to do everything in their own power, their own merit, or they're trying to follow some system, and both of those are, are a dead-end street. But what Jesus says is there's a narrow way. So I like to think of it as basically an overpass, a road that runs over the dead end. And Jesus says, that narrow road leads to freedom. And by the way, that narrow road is who I am. Many people travel the broad road, but few find the narrow road. And the narrow road leads to this incredible freedom. It leads to this eternal life. But the way we find that narrow road is to realize that God came from heaven to earth in the form of a human. His name is Jesus, and he has opened the way for us to come to God. In other words, God come to us so that we can be in relationship with him and live out our purpose in life. But so many people are still trying to do things or not do things in order to get to God. And Jesus says, both of those ways lead to destruction. They lead to a dead end. And the only way to come to the Father is on the narrow road or another passage, Jesus says, I'm the gate. Another passage, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes through the Father except through me. And so what he's drawing at today is the way to freedom is through the sacrifice that he offered. And the question for each of us today is, are we on the narrow road? Are we on the road to freedom? And you say, well, I think I am. Well, according to Galatians, you can know you are. And that's what I wanna share with you today. You can know that you're on that road. You can know that you haven't just, you know what, moved from one side of this road to the other side of the road and you're on this, on this you know, pathway to destruction. Because the Bible says that once we come into this right relationship that God offers us, that God begins to coach us in this amazing freedom to be everything he has created us to be. And so Galatians says it this way, in Galatians chapter five, and I, I wanna read through it because the Bible says we can know who we are by the fruit that we produce. You can know who a person is by, by what comes out of their life. And so what I like to do occasionally is just do a fruit inspection of my own life. We're, we're really good at looking at other people's life and deciding if they're on the narrow road or not. But all of this stuff is written so that you will know without a shadow of a doubt your heart is connected to the God of the universe and you're allowing him to lead you into amazing freedom. Listen to what the scripture says in Galatians 5, verses 16 through 26. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do what is evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desire that is opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are di directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. He says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But those but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit's leading in every parts of our life. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So right here, the Bible tells us in that same passage of Scripture where it says for us to, be, to, to live in freedom, it says that we can know we're in that freedom by inspecting our own lives, by inspecting the fruit out of our own lives in our own lives. And so I have to ask the question today, are you on the narrow road? Are you on the road to freedom? Are you on the broad road? Because the way to get on the narrow road is to put your faith, your trust, your belief is God is a God who desires a relationship with you and comes to you and put your faith in Jesus and then begin to follow the spirit he puts in you all, all the days of your life. And truly, you can look at your life and see, are you trying to make everybody else measure up to you? Are you trying to do things in your own power, in your own might to get to God? Or are you truly trusting what Jesus has already done for us? And then when you trust that, the Bible says the fruit, what comes out of your life will begin to show. So which one are you producing? Is it, is it, is it bitterness? Is it anger? Is it jealousy? Because the Bible says, is it envy? Is it trying to make everybody else be like you? Because that's what people were trying to do in, in the day that Jesus wrote this stuff. And, and Paul said this stuff, uh, is, is people were trying to make people follow systems and be like them and saying, this is the only way to God when God had already provided a way through Jesus. And so we all need to be fruit inspectors of our life. And so the question that lies before us this Freedom Weekend is for each of us to ask ourselves the question, are we living in a freedom? Can you bow your heads, please? God, I thank you so much for the freedom you offer in Christ Jesus. And God, if there is one person here today who is not living in that freedom, God, their life isn't producing this amazing fruit that you offer. God, I pray today would be the day that they put their faith in that you come to us instead of us coming to you. And God, I thank you that you sent your one and only son into this world to die a death that we all deserve, God, and defeated death and resurrected from a grave. And my friend, if you have never put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, now would be a great opportunity for you to do that. You just simply say, God, you know what? I'm tired of trying and do it in my own might, my own power. And God, I realize you love me so much. You sent Jesus into the world to die for me. Tell God, thank you for that gift of salvation. And tell God from this point forward, you don't walk on the road of freedom, the narrow road, and do amazing things with your life. Tell God, thank you for that gift. And it's in his name we pray, amen. We hope you were encouraged, motivated, and inspired today by the message. And again, man, we believe in you. We believe great things for you. It's because of many people's faithful given that we're able to go out around the world. If you choose to invest in Barefoot Church, just go on over to barefootchurch.com. You can give there. But go out, live your purpose, and be inspired in a great, great way.